We are online, so. Mm -hmm. So, uh, should I start? Oh, yes, sir. You should start. Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Next Hello. Today, we are going to have an integrated class with radiology and surgery department. So first, myself, Dr. Rajan Punya, I'm from radiology. We are going to discuss about the radiological investigation of esophagus with the related pathologies. And we do have Dr. Nachiketa from surgery, one of the best teachers for the surgery part. And special thanks to Dr. Sneel Sharma to providing us such a good and a wonderful platform like Nextulo where we can interact with our students. So let's start with the esophagus. Now, here we are going to start. So first thing we are going to talk about is the barium swallow. Barium suspension is made up of pure barium sulfate. Every sort of barium preparation is not used because most of them are poisonous. Only barium sulfate is used and barium is used in a form of suspension, not in a form of solution. So never get confused. Barium is not soluble. It's a suspension in which we are going to use high density, low viscosity barium for the esophagus. Barium studies are divided like barium swallow. In barium swallow, we are going to see oropharynx, the pharyngeal part and esophagus up to the gastroesophageal junction. That study we call it barium swallow. Now, when we are going to cover the stomach looking for the small, then we are going to call it barium meal. And when we are covering up to the gastroesoph uh, from the gastroesophageal junction till the cecum, then we are going to call it follow through. And when we are going to look for the uh, large bowel, then we are going to call it barium enema. So first we are going to talk about the barium swallow today. What are the advantage? Advantage is that it's have an excellent coating. We can see the outer and the inner coat also, and it is less cost. Okay. Disadvantage are that in case if there is an aspiration or it get into your respiratory tract, then it can cause fibrosis. Okay, these are the few disadvantages, but it's a common practice to use the barium for the esophagus and even for the further cheeks. Now, let's talk about this. Esophageal disorders are clearly by the full column techniques. Now, what are the common things we are going to see? Like any circumferential carcinoma, diffuse esophageal spasm, which is, this is a very common question, corkscrew appearance. I'm going to show what it is for the ecclesia in which we get the bird beak appearance. Okay. Now we can look for the structures, we can look for the large esophageal ulcers, we can look for the hiatus and for which it is one of the investigation of the choice. Okay. Now look at this image. What is this? In this, we are looking that the esophagus is filled and it appearing bright. Why it is bright? Because what we are using here, barium, is a contrast agent. It is a positive contrast agent means it will appear bright as compared to the surrounding structures. Now look at it. What we are looking at is the AP view. Okay. We also take the AP view. We look for the lateral view and the oblique views. Now what we are looking at, can you appreciate students? Can you appreciate this esophagus? Now what is this? This is gastroesophageal junction and the contrast is passing into the stomach. Okay. So this is a normal barium swallow. Okay, now let's come to the next image. Now, look at this image. What we are looking at, what is this part? This is esophagus. Don't confuse this, sir. It's right. It's just due to the uh, image orientation. Don't get confused with it. Okay, just look at this part. 
Okay. What is happening? That esophagus is filled with contrast. There is a narrowing out here. Okay. And the contrast is passing into the stomach. Due to this narrowing, there is proximal dilatation of esophagus. So what is this condition? This is condition is called ecclesia cardia. The further explanation of ecclesia cardia, you will be, uh, this will be discussed by Dr. Nachiketa. Okay. Just remember this. Now look at this. What we are looking at here. Look. Look at the proximal part of esophagus. It is normally dilated. But what is happening out here? Why this is showing a corkscrew appearance? This is due to abnormal peristalsis. And the appearance is the typical corkscrew appearance. And we are going to say it in diffuse esophageal spasm. Okay, remember it. It is a very important question for your exam. Now look at this image. This is... What is this? Can you see? Patient is having the contrast. This is, look at this part. This is pharynx. And can you see this? We are looking at the lateral view. Okay. The two images we have seen before are the AP, anterior, posterior, or frontal view. This is a lateral view. Can you appreciate these? These are the cervicals. Now look at this. The upper part of esophagus appearing fine. Look at this part. But what is this? Can you see out pouching? Okay. So what is this? What we are going to call an out pouching? We call it a diverticulum. Okay. Further. Now look at this. This is a diverticulum and what we are going to call it? We are going to call it Zenker's diverticulum. Okay. Details will be discussed later. Now look at this. What we are looking at? We are looking at an x-ray with a patient with barium contrast ingested. What is this? This is esophagus. Okay. Look at this part. What is happening out here? Can you see the esophageal, gastroesophageal junction is not well visualized. Stomach is out here, but it seems like it has protruded or herniated upwards. So what is this? This is hiatus hernia. Can you see these white lines? These are the rugged folds. Okay. Gastric rugged folds. And what is this? This is gastroesophageal junction. This part which is herniated upwards. Okay. So this is hiatus hernia. Now look at this image. This is, what is this? This is barium swallow image. Lateral view. Can you appreciate this cervical spine? Okay. This is the lateral view. Now what we are looking at. Can you see this is a small line? This a defect out here. What is this? This is called esophageal web. Okay. This is a direct question. You are going to get an image like this and the patient will present with a difficulty in swallowing with pain. Okay. So this is an esophageal web. Now let's talk about this. This is the esophagus. This is the stomach and look at this part, a small narrowing. Okay. The small narrowing, we call it A-ring. The A-ring is a transient smooth muscular ring just above the vestibule. Can you see this part? This is called B-ring. Okay. It is normally present. It is a thin mucosal. Pardon. Okay. This is a thin mucosal ring. This. Okay. At gastroesophageal junction. But it is normally present. But if it's pathological, Okay, if it's symptomatic, it's get thickened, then what we are going to call it? We are going to call it cetaceous ring. Okay, so B ring is normally present, but if it gets symptomatic, it's leading to some sort of symptoms, then we are going to call it cetaceous ring. And it is usually associated with gastroesophageal, sorry, hiatus hernia. Okay, just look at this. Okay, look at this. We have seen this. This is esophagus. This is stomach. What are these? These are the rugged folds. So stomach is herniated. Okay. And we call it hiatal hernia. Now, can you appreciate this narrowing? This is called stashid. Okay. Now, I would like to pass on the further lecture.
who are one of our favorite teachers, even teacher to mine also, Dr. Nachiketa. Okay, sir. Kindly, sir. Okay. <laughs> Hi, guys. I'm Dr. Nachiketa. Uh, you'll have to stop this screen sharing, uh, Dr. Ajendra, only then I can... Uh, awesome. And give me the uh, host right. Sir, I'm giving. Mm. So, guys, in the meantime, I'm Dr. Nachiketa, the faculty for surgery with Nick Stiller. Your one stop platform for all your exams, be it either your NEET preparation or your next preparation as it is going to be, or maybe for USMLE and FLAP. So, uh, a very special thanks to Dr. Sunil for giving us this platform. So, let's start with the uh, our part. So I have stopped sharing. Okay. Kindly continue, sir. Thank you. So, let's start with the surgical part of it. Let's start with the hiatus hernia. <clears throat> so, uh, is my screen visible? So now let's start with it, the hiatus hernia. Now, what do we mean by hiatus hernia? Hiatus hernia is actually the herniation of the abdominal content into the thoracic cavity through the esophageal hiatus. Now, what is this esophageal hiatus? This esophageal hiatus is actually a defect in the diaphragm through which the esophagus enters into the abdominal cavity from the thoracic cavity, okay? So now this herniation, the hiatus hernia can be further classified into four different variants. The first important variant of this esophageal hernia or rather uh, hiatal hernia is known as the sliding hernia. As you can see in this picture that the sliding hernia, what happens? In sliding hernia, this upper part of the stomach, this part over here, has been pulled up into the thoracic cavity. So this is known as type 1 hiatal hernia or the sliding type of hiatal hernia. And this is by far the most common type of hiatus hernia and accounts for around 95% cases of all the different types of hiatal hernias. The second variant that we have for the hiatal hernia is known as the rolling hernia. Now, in this rolling hernia, as you can see in this picture, what happens here is that this upper part of the stomach here, this part, this part has rolled up into the thoracic cavity here. It has rolled up by the side of the esophagus. And therefore, this is known as the rolling hernia. This rolling hernia, this is the type 2 hiatus hernia and is also known as the paraesophageal hernia. So remember this thing for question that paraesophageal hernia, mainly we mean the rolling hernia. And rolling hernia is type 2 uh, hiatal hernia. Okay. Then comes the next variant, the type 3 hiatal hernia. This type 3 hiatal hernia is the mixed hernia which has component both of the sliding type and also over here of the rolling type. So you can see that the gastroesophageal junction has been pulled up over here and the upper part of the stomach has also rolled up into the thoracic cavity. So this is it, the type 3. And type 4 hiatal hernia, this is the herniation of other abdominal content into the thoracic cavity along with the stomach. So what you see over here in this picture is that this is the gastroesophageal junction and this has 
pulled up over here. This is the sliding type of hiat uh, hiatal hernia. This portion that you see here, this portion is the rolling hernia. And along with this, you see something over here also, which is herniated over here. This is actually the spleen. Now, this spleen also has herniated into the thoracic cavity along with the uh, upper part of the stomach. And this is known as type 4 hiatal hernia, which is the herniation of the other abdominal content into the thoracic cavity along with the stomach. It may be the liver, it may be the spleen, or it may be any other organ that may have herniated into the thoracic cavity. So now this uh, hernia that we have, what are the clinical features? How does it present to us? The sliding hernia is actually very common and it is an incidental x-ray finding in more than 40% of the adult population. Meaning thereby that almost 40% of the adult population has hiatal hernia or radiological evidence of hiatal hernia. And we also know that the sliding hernia is the most common variant of the hiatal hernia. Usually, the hiatal hernias are asymptomatic. They have very minor features. Usually, the features overlap as we have with the gastroesophageal reflux disease. So, if it precipitates are present or there are some clinical features, by far, the important ones are that there is going to be reflux and regurgitation. There is a difference between these two things. Reflux means that there is an anatomical structure or there is an anatomical barrier or maybe a physiological barrier. From below this barrier, the contents come above it. This is known as the reflux. And regurgitation is just from above itself, if it is coming out, coming back. So the clinical presentation of the hiatal hernia is reflux and regurgitation. These are two different words. Then we may have dysphagia along with it. Along with dysphagia, the patients of the paraesophageal hernias, what may happen is that suppose this is the hernia and the stomach has come out along with it, rolled up over here, this area. This may compress the esophagus and ultimately lead to a compromise of the blood supply. And therefore, the paraesophageal hernias may incarcerate or strangulate. Okay. So, furthermore, most of the patients with GERD, that is gastroesophageal reflux disease, have hiatus hernia, which is usually sliding. But less than 50% of the patients of hiatus hernia have GERD. So this is just the opposite thing. That patient is having GERD, he may have the hiatus hernia. It is very likely. But if the patient has hiatal hernia, then we cannot say that he is having GERD or he is not having GERD. Okay? So this is the relationship between these two. Got it? What actually happens in GERD is, that as the acid keeps on refluxing back into the esophagus, it leads to inflammation and ultimately there is going to be fibrosis. And due to the fibrosis, the stomach is pulled up into the thoracic cavity. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is or these are the clinical presentation of the hiatus hernia. And once we suspect that the patient may be having the hiatus hernia, what should we do? we should definitely investigate the patient. Now, the investigation of choice for hiatus hernia is the barium swallow. Especially a supine film, this is the investigation of choice. Okay. So this barium swallow is the investigation of choice. And as Dr. Rajendra has already shown us that how the hiatus hernia looks like or appears on the barium swallow. Okay. Large hiatus hernia may be visible just on plain x-rays. And sometimes endoscopy may be used in the diagnosis of hiatal hernia. 
but this is something which is not very commonly used. The most important investigation is the barium swallow. And then coming up to the management of the hiatal hernia. In the hiatus hernia, if the hiatus hernia is asymptomatic, then it does not warrant any specific type of management options or management. We just have to go with few lifestyle management or lifestyle changes. And along with that, if the patient has GERD, we can go with the management of the acid reflux with the help of the proton pump inhibitors. For the asymptomatic variant of the hiatus hernia, the patient should be advised to make modifications in the lifestyle, like he should quit smoking, quit alcohol, reduce fatty food, then he has to reduce weight, then along with that, he should avoid carbonated beverages. Technically, it means that only lifestyle changes are required, and along with that, if reflux is there, proton pump inhibitors may be given to the patient, okay? If the hiatus hernia becomes symptomatic, in the symptomatic hiatus hernias, definitely they are going to require surgery. And especially so, the paraesophageal symptomatic hernia should be managed by surgery as there is a risk of incarceration. That means compromise of the blood supply, which may lead to necrosis of the lower part of the esophagus. So they should be reduced surgically. And a number of different types of surgeries are utilized. One of the most important surgeries that we utilize for the management of the hiatal hernia, these surgeries may either be endoscopic or they may be open surgeries. Normally, now we prefer to go with the endoscopic surgeries. The commonest surgery now used for the management of hiatus hernia is the Nissen fund application. This is by far the most common surgery performed for the management of the hiatus hernia, okay? Endoscopic is preferred as it reduces the morbidity and also decreases the healing time, okay? So this is management option, actually, this Nissen fund application. This is the management of gastroesophageal reflux disease. We may say that hiatus hernia is just a continuum of the gastroesophageal reflux disease and most of the treatment options that are used for the management of the gastroesophageal reflux disease are also the management options for the hiatus hernias. So anyways, for the question, the most common surgery used for management of hiatus hernia is the Nissen fund application. Okay. Now, if the defect is large, then we may use a mesh to strengthen the lower end or to strengthen the diaphragm. It may be utilized. Now, these surgeries that we utilize for the management of the hiatal hernia, as I've already told you, that the management of GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and hiatus hernias are almost the same. You can see this first picture over here. This is showing us the Nissen fund application. Then we may have the DOR fund application. And then we may have the Tupet fund application. Nissen fund application that we have is by far the most common surgery utilized. And this is a 360 degree wrap. This is a 360 degree wrap over here around the upper part of the stomach so that it does not pull up into the thoracic cavity. Most common surgery used for hiatus hernia is Nissen fund application. And then what are the complications over here? If we perform these surgeries, especially the Nissen fund application, then what could be the complication here? The common complications of the surgery for the hiatus hernia, the first thing that happens is that there is difficulty in belching and vomiting. The reason being that we have compressed this area, so this cannot come up into the uh, thoracic cavity. But along with that, what we are doing is that we are compressing this upper end of the esophagus too. Due to this, the reflux that we have is definitely going to decrease. And once the reflux is going to decrease in that scenario, belching and vomiting are going to become difficult. Okay, so then we may have diarrhea, abdominal bloating because whatever we have accumulated along with feeding the air that goes into us, our stomach, 
belching has decreased. This may lead to abdominal bloating and dysphagia may be there that because once again, we have formed a constriction here. We have compressed this area. The gastroesophageal junction just below it. What we have done is that we have compressed the stomach. So the patient may also develop dysphagia. To overcome these complications, we can go with the partial fundoplication, just as I showed you right now. We had the door and the tuppet fundoplication. Okay. Now, the next important disease that we have for the esophagus is our achalasia cardia. Actually, what we are dealing right now with is these are all known as the motility disorders of the esophagus, and we have many different types of motility disorders. Even GERD and hiatal hernias are motility disorders of the esophagus. Along with that, we may have plasia cardia, we may have the diffuse esophageal spas, we may have the nutcrackers esophagus, and also the different types of diverticulum that we may encounter. We will see them later on. Now, what is this achalasia cardia? This achalasia cardia is due to the loss of the ganglia cell in the arbux plexus. Now, what happens here? That if the ganglia cells are lost here, then the tone of the lower esophagus, especially the gastroesophageal junction, increases. And ultimately, this area becomes compressed because the relaxation is lost due to the loss of the ganglia cells. So this area will not relax and the tone of this area is going to increase. So now this disease is due to the loss of the ganglia cell in the Arbux plexus and this leads to high resting lower esophageal sphincter pressure or we may say over here that there is increased tone increased tone of lower esophageal sphincter. This may happen over here. Once again, there is a failure of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax during swallowing. And then there is absence of coordinated peristalsis in the body of the esophagus. One problem with this disease is that with achalasia cardia, there is an increased incidence of the squamous cell cancer of the lower esophagus. Mind you, as we will see later on, that usually in the lower esophagus, we have the adenocarcinoma. The commonest malignancy in the lower one third of the esophagus is adenocarcinoma. But in association with achalasia cardia, a squamous cell cancer may develop in the lower one third. And the incidence has increased 10 times more in comparison to the other population group that we have. And then there is one more word that is used known as the pseudo achalasia. Pseudo achalasia is an achalasia like disease or disorder that is produced by the adenocarcinoma of the cardiac. As just right now, I was telling you that the commonest malignancy in the lower esophagus is adenocarcinoma. And this is also going to cause in the stricture in that area, actually the obstruction of the lower esophagus. And this may give us a presentation like the malignancy, uh, sorry, the achalasia cardia, this malignancy. And this picture is known as pseudo achalasia because now it is caused by malignancy. Otherwise, overall, what happens is that there is a loss of ganglia cell why the achalasia cardia precipitates, but not in the malignancy. Now, this achalasia cardia in itself can be classified into two different variants. Either we may have a primary achalasia or we may have a secondary achalasia. For the primary achalasia, the etiology is not known. Why the ganglia cells are not present in the lower esophagus, this is not known. In secondary achalasia, this is secondary to a known disease like the Chagas disease or the malignancy. Malignancy, we have right now seen that the presentation may be like achalasia cardia, which we had called pseudo achalasia. Okay. So secondary achalasia is secondary to a known disease, whereas primary achalasia, the etiology is not known. For the questions, always remember that whenever achalasia is asked, and if they ask the etiology, 
then the etiology should be that the etiology is not known. Secondary achalasia is a rare happen happening or occurrence. Achalasia mainly is primary variant, the etiology for which we do not know. Now this achalasia cardia, how to investigate it? The patient basically presents to us with dysphagia and chest pain. And here, once again, remember one thing, that whenever a patient presents to us with dysphagia, whatever other type of investigations we may perform, the investigation for dysphagia is always endoscopy. What we are going to see here is that endoscopy is not the choice here. Even uh, for a number of different other types of diseases, the endoscopy, especially for the motility disorders, endoscopy is not the choice. But dysphagia in itself, which is a feature of different esophageal diseases, the investigation of choice for dysphagia is endoscopy and any patient presenting with dysphagia should have an endoscopy done. Now, coming back to our achalasia, how to investigate it? Right now, as uh, Dr. Rajendra has shown us also, that we have a very specific barium swallow picture for achalasia. But overall, the investigation of choice for achalasia cardia is manometry. Manometry is the investigation of choice for achalasia cardia. And the firm diagnosis of achalasia is established by esophageal manometry. What we do over here, is that we measure the pressure of the lower esophagus and the esophageal sphincter, LES, lower esophageal sphincter, with the help of the probes. Now, what happens here that when the patient swallows, normally the lower esophageal sphincter should relax. But in these patients, the lower esophagus or the lower esophageal sphincter fails to relax with swallowing. So a firm diagnosis of achalasia or the investigation of choice for achalasia is weak appearance. Okay. Now, mind you over here that there is an appearance which is known as the rat tail appearance. Rat tail. Rat tail appearance. This rat tail appearance may be seen with both achalasia and malignancy. Achalasia also and with malignancy also. Okay. So these two are questions for us. Bird's beak and rat tail. There is a specific difference between these two. Both of them may be seen with achalasia and both of them may also be seen with malignancy. Okay. But it is said that the specific barium picture of achalasia is bird's beak and the specific picture of the adenocarcinoma of esophagus is rat tail. The difference is not clear. It is just for the questions. Okay. So this is it, barium swallow. And along with that, as the patient has a dysphagia, for a patient with dysphagia, we always have to perform the endoscopy. All patients should be evaluated with endoscopy. And then comes in the management of the achalasia cardia. Initially, we may try to go with the medical management of the achalasia cardia. Though this medical management of achalasia is not very effective, but, but we may try to give the patient these smooth muscle relaxants. These drugs include the calcium channel blockers or we may utilize the nitrates to relax the smooth muscles of the lower esophagus so that the symptoms are relieved. We can also go with forceful dilation of the lower esophageal sphincter this forceful dilation may be done either with the help of metallic bougies. We insert the bougie over in that area and we are going to dilate this lower esophageal sphincter. Or we can first insert the balloon dilator and then we can inflate the area, the balloon, and ultimately this is going to dilate. What you see here in this picture is actually the balloon dilator being used or the balloon dilator has been shown here in this picture. 
then we may also go with the hiller's myotomy actually hiller's myotomy is the management of the achalasia in hiller's myotomy what we do over here before that just a little bit of anatomy in esophagus what happens here is that we have the circular muscle fibers and we also have the longitudinal muscle fibers longitudinal goes down like this and the circular they surround the esophagus and ultimately the peristalsis happens because of that the muscles in the esophagus in different areas have different component the upper portion of the esophagus has only the or mainly the longitudinal muscles the middle portion has both longitudinal and circular whereas the lower most portion has only the circular muscles what we do over here in hellers myotomy suppose these are the muscle fibers the circular muscle and this is the esophagus going like this what we do is that we cut out these circular muscle fibers like this so that this area dilates out okay so this is the hellers myotomy in hellers myotomy lower esophageal sphincter is sacrificed meaning thereby that it is also cut out and ultimately the patient will develop gastroesophageal reflux because we have destroyed the ileus so in hellers myotomy lower esophageal sphincter is destroyed one more management option is available suppose if the patient is not fit for surgery in that scenario we can go with the botulinum toxin injection in that area botulinum toxins actually what we they do is that they cause the spasm of the muscle over there and ultimately the muscles this area becomes dilated out due to the spasm of the circular muscle fibers over there this is utilized only in those patients which are not fit for surgery or not desirous of surgery the effect of botulinum toxin is not long lived the patient will need repeated injections maybe 3 months 6 months once again when the features precipitate once again we need to inject this toxin okay and then there is a endoscopic surgery which is also available for us in the management of achalasia cardia which is known as poem this poem that we have this stands for per oral endoscopic myotomy okay p o e m per oral endoscopic myotomy in this what we do is that the endoscope is inserted over here a dye is injected in this area making an incision in the mucosa and incision is done over here in the mucosa and ultimately a dye is injected and then the incision over here that we have made here through the mucosa the endoscope is inserted further inside like this in the third picture you see and the circular muscle fibers are cut and ultimately the endoscope is withdrawn back and the area the incision is closed with clips this is known as poem per oral endoscopic myotomy actually a number of surgeries endoscopic surgeries may be done in this way what we have done in this surgery that the endoscope is inserted through the oral cavity a natural orifice a natural opening okay and any one of these surgeries suppose we go in through the oral cavity we may also go in through the anal opening natural opening is being utilized to perform the endoscopic surgery and these surgeries are known as nots n o t e s n stands for natural o is orifice t is transluminal going through the lumen endoscopic surgery n o t e s notes so poem is just a type of notes as you can see okay this question is also asked what is the meaning of notes poem stands for actually there is a disease also which is known as p o m e s poems that disease is actually associated with scleroderma okay so poem poems these are two different thing poem is endoscopic surgery poems is a syndrome fine s as soon as it comes it becomes a syndrome so this was our achalasia cardia the next important motility disorder is our diffuse esophageal spasm but before that some important points regarding the achalasia cardia if we go in for the non surgical management of achalasia cardia we had a number of options 
we had the smooth muscle relaxants like the calcium channel blockers and the nitrates. And then we also had the botulinum injection. Amongst the non-surgical management options that we have, pneumatic dilation is the most effective non-surgical management. Okay, the most effective non-surgical management is pneumatic dilation for achalasia. Fine. Smooth muscle relaxants are the least effective management of achalasia. We may utilize a number of them. Okay. Now, these drugs that we utilize could be calcium channel blockers. Most commonly like nifadipine. This is the most common drug that is utilized in the management, nifadipine, sublingually. Then we may use the long-acting nitrates. We may also utilize sidenafil. We may also utilize the anticholinergic drugs like atropine or dicyclamine, which is actually just a congener of it. We may also utilize beta adrenergic blockers like terbutaline, theophylline, etc., to relax the smooth muscles. Okay. So these are the drugs. Among these drugs, the important thing to remember is calcium channel blockers and the long acting nitrates. They are the least effective management, by the way. The most common complication post Heller's myotomy. What we did was that we destroyed the LES and ultimately the reflux starts. The most common complication of Heller's myotomy is gastroesophageal reflux. And then botulinum toxin, what do they do? What is the effect of the toxin? Botulinum toxin blocks the presynaptic release of acetylcholine. Okay. Due to this, this effectively is doing the same thing as we have the adrenergic blockers. Acetylcholine was blocked there. Here, the acetylcholine release is blocked. Okay. So, this, this is the action of botulinum toxin. So, now let's come to our diffuse esophageal spasm. What actually is this? In diffuse esophageal spasm, what happens? In diffuse esophageal spasm, suppose this whole esophagus is there. This is the tube for that matter. Just think like that. Simultaneously, at a number of points, contractions happen in the esophagus. So there is a strong non-peristaltic, not associated with peristalsis. Simultaneous contraction of the esophagus at different areas. Remember the picture that Dr. Rajendra showed us? That we had dilation and then a constriction, then a dilation, then a constriction like that. What has happened that those areas, there was constriction. Okay, contraction had happened simultaneously all over the esophagus. So this is a strong non-peristaltic simultaneous contraction of the esophagus. In comparison to achalasia, where the lower esophageal sphincter tone was increased, here the lower esophageal sphincter tone is normal and the relaxation is normal. In achalasia, the relaxation was lost. Here the LES is normal. This is happening in the body of the esophagus all over, but not in the lower esophageal sphincter. To remember it, there is something very simple to remember. Most of us had one point or the other point of our life have suffered from uh, psychological stress, emotional stress. And you may all have or most of us may have experienced it that at that time if we drink water or we eat something, Sometimes we feel that there is a pain over here and it has become stuck here. This is what actually is happening, that there is a spasm of the esophagus. Okay. So this is something similar to it. So LES tone is normal here. This is not going to happen always. This DES. Diffuse esophageal spasm may be associated with GERD, gastroesophageal reflux. Now, what are the symptoms of it? In this, we have substernal chest pain, which is often described as squeezing. This is what I was just telling you, that we have a pain here when we are trying to eat. We were emotionally distressed. Like there was an exam coming or we have lost somebody, somebody left us, things like that. So substernal chest pain, this may be with or without dysphagia. Okay. Now, this chest pain may radiate to the back, neck, ears, arms. 
making it very difficult to differentiate it from angina pectoris. And what happens here once again is the same scenario. The person was emotionally distressed, developed this picture that there was chest pain here, and maybe the pain was radiating to the back or maybe even to the arm. And we start thinking, oh, he is having angina. He is emotionally distressed. But what actually the person was having was a chalasia, uh, sorry, the diffuse esophageal spasm. Okay. Now, this pain may aggravate by cold or hot liquids and exercises, and there may be a psychological component to the disease. This is what I was just speaking right now. So, this is the diffuse esophageal spasm. The investigation for diffuse esophageal spasm, once again, the important things. We can perform a barium swallow, which gives us the corkscrew appearance, the same picture that Dr. Ajendra was showing us. You see it, the spasm here, contraction here, the contraction here, the contraction in this area. We have a number of points where the contraction has happened. And ultimately, we are having columns of barium in the esophagus. This is known as our corkscrew appearance, an uh, important question for us. The diagnosis is going to be made by manometry as we have to check out for the pressure that there is a contraction or not, or is there any other specific pathology. Manometry is the investigation of choice. The finding of manometry is that there is a high amplitude repetitive contraction with a normal sphincter response to swallowing. The LES is uh, normal. The classical definition is for the diffuse esophageal spasm that there is more than two uncoordinated contraction during 10 consecutive wet swallows, that is barium. More than 20% simultaneous esophageal contraction during the standardized stationary motility setting. Fine. So this is the specific finding of DES on manometry. The patient, if he has dysphagia, we will once again perform the endoscope. The management. The management of diffuse esophageal spasm is a little bit difficult. Actually, it is not amenable to a number of management options or rather no management is quite effective, be it medical, be it surgical. First of all, we try to go with the medical management and J should be preferred. We give the same smooth muscle relaxants like the calcium channel blockers or the nitrates or sildenafil that we had seen, all of those drugs can be used here too. <clears throat> okay. Surgery may be done, but surgery is only moderately effective. And the surgery consists of long esophagomyotomy. Now, overall in this whole area of the esophagus, the circular muscle fibers are cut out. Mainly the lower one third and also of the middle one third. These Circular muscle fibers, smooth muscles are cut out. Mind you, the lower esophageal sphincter is normal. We won't touch it. In achalasia, we destroyed LES. Here, the lower esophageal sphincter should be preserved. It should not be destroyed. So care should be taken to preserve the lower esophageal function. And if significant GERD is present along with the disease or along with the presentation, we should go with the anti-reflux procedure like the Nissen fundoplication, Tupet or Dor fundoplication. They may be done along with this long, long esophago myotomy. Okay. So these are the management options, medical, smooth muscle relaxants, and then surgery. Surgery from the arch of aorta up to the LES, LES preserved. Okay. The difference between these two on the manometry. As you can see here, that manometry is the best investigation to establish the motility disorder or the gastroesophageal reflux or the functional abnormalities of the esophagus. Okay. So, how to differentiate which one is happening based on the manometry? In achalasia, what happens is that there is incomplete LES relaxation, less than 75% of the relaxations. When the person swallows, LES fails to relax. There is a peristalsis in the esophageal body, no normal peristalsis. And the LES tone is increased to more than equal to 26 mmHg. In the diffuse esophageal spasm, simultaneous non-peristaltic contractions are there. 
more than 20% of the wet swallows, repetitive and multi-peaked contraction, and in between the episodes, the peristalsis is normal. So remember here, peristalsis is normal. Here, the peristalsis is a peristalsis absent. LES tone here is increased, whereas LES tone in diffuse esophageal spasm is normal. So this is the manometric difference between these two. Now coming up to the esophageal diverticulas, which once again are a motility disorder for the esophagus. Now these esophageal diverticulas can either be true diverticulas or they may be false diverticulas. In true diverticulum, all the layers of them has moved out. This is an out pouching with all the three layers. In false diverticulum, what happens? Suppose this is the lining, outer lining of the esophagus, the muscular wall. The inner lining is going to come out like this. This is a false diverticulum. This is actually a herniation. Whereas in true diverticulum, all the three layers are going to become dilated like this. Okay, this is what is a true diverticulum. Both of them may be seen in the esophagus. False diverticulums are more common in comparison to the true diverticulums. These true diverticulums can either be mid-esophageal, that is in the middle part of the esophagus, or they may be epiphrenic, just above the diaphragm. These mid-esophageal uh, diverticulas, these are seen in association with traction from the mediastinal inflammatory diseases. Suppose there is a lymph node here, it is attached to the esophagus, and if there is a, uh, what you call, calcification here, this will pull the esophagus out and ultimately will cause in a diverticulum. This is why they are known as the traction diverticulum. There is a traction pulling out, traction diverticulums. Then, we have the epiphrenic diverticulum. This is seen just above the diaphragm and is seen in association with motility disorders. Like suppose the patient was having achalasia, the lower esophageal sphincter tone has increased. The food goes down, obstructs here. The pressure in this area increases and it pushes the esophagus out. And ultimately, a diverticulum may form out. So this is epiphrenic above the diaphragm. False diverticulums, these are known as the pulgin diverticula. Pulgin diverticulum. What happens now here is that there is a pulling out of the inner layer. These are out pouching of the mucosa and submucosa through the wall of the esophagus through a point of weakness. We'll just see these points of weaknesses in the next slide. One of the best examples that we have for the false diverticulum of the esophagus is the Zenker's diverticulum. Zenker's diverticulum is the outpouching of mucosa and submucosa through a weakness in the cricopharyngeus muscle. So now let's talk about this Zenker's diverticulum. Zenker's diverticulum actually is the most common esophageal diverticulum. This is our question that what is the most common esophageal diverticulum? Then the answer is going to be Zenker's diverticulum. Is it true? Is it false? It is a false diverticulum. Okay. Now, this diverticulum, why does and how does it precipitate? Now, if you see this first picture over here, you can see that this thyropharyngeus that we have, and over here we have this the cricopharyngeus muscle. That means the horizontal and the oblique fibers of the cricopharyngeus, we see a defect here. This defect that we have is known as the dehiscence of Killian. Okay. Just below the dehiscence of Killian, below the cricopharyngeus muscle over here, this area, once again, there is a defect in this area. This defect is known as the Limer's de dehiscence. And then laterally over here also, we have defects on both the sides. This defect is known as the Killian Jamison area or the Killian Jamison dehiscence. Okay. Protrusion through this Killian dehiscence. This is what is known as the Zenker's diverticulum. Protrusion posteriorly of the mucosa and submucosa through the dehiscence of Killian 
which is a defect between the oblique and the horizontal fibers of the cricopharyngeus. And just below this area or lateral to this area, we have seen that there is a defect which is known as the Killian Jamison area. We may also have diverticulum forming here too. We'll see later on. Now, once the diverticulum, suppose this is this area was the area where the defect is, the pressure increased and ultimately the mucosa, some mucosa herniated out. The Zenker's diverticulum forms here. It increases in size and ultimately goes down and compresses the esophagus landing or precipitating dysphagia. The clinical presentation of the Zenker's diverticulum is mainly dysphagia. Dysphagia may be either pharyngeal or it may be esophageal. Initially, we have the pharyngeal dysphagia, which is later on followed by the esophageal dysphagia. Okay. So both the types of dysphagias are seen here. And then when food comes over here into this area, the diverticulum and stays here. Over a time, it decays and foul smell starts coming out of it. This is known as helitosis, foul breath, it comes out. So helitosis may also be present here. The investigation of choice for the Zenker's diverticulum, if it is suspected, is the barium swallow. A very nice picture shown to us by Dr. Rajendra. You can see here, this is our Zenker's diverticulum. Thanks to Dr. Rajendra for the pictures. These radiographs, this is a barium swallow showing us Zenker's diverticulum. Fine. The management. The management of diverticulum can be done endoscopically. This endoscopic management of the diverticulum is known as diverticuloesophagostomy. The endoscope is inserted over here and this area in between this area is obliterated and ultimately this whole thing is brought over here and sutured to the esophagus. It becomes something like this, the second picture. This is known as diverticuloesophagostomy. Ostomy. Okay. This is known as the Dolman's procedure. This is Dolman's procedure is the endoscopic surgery. Open surgeries may also be done. We can go with either the diverticulopexy in which the diverticulum can be brought up and sutured here. Pexy, suturing, involving the suturing over here, involving pouch excision, pouch suspension, and or myotomy of the cricopharyngeus. And then we can go with diverticulectomy. That means just cut it out, remove it. Diverticulectomy. <clears throat> Then comes in our other important disease over here for the esophagus or the other diverticulas that we can see here in this area, as we have seen here. We had the Killian dehiscence, the Lamyers dehiscence, and we also have the Killian Jamison area. Herniations or diverticulations may happen from these areas too. The second picture will show you this first that you see here, this diverticulum or this diverticulum, actually the herniation. What happened? My screen sharing has stopped. Hello. Uh, Dr. Punia, please make me the host again. Uh, sir, wait a minute. Just some minor problems. Sir, so just wait a minute, sir. I'm sure, 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 sure. We're rectifying it. So now coming back to it. Now this 
as you can see here, the first one that we have through the dehiscence of Killian, through the dehiscence of Killian, we had our Zenker's diverticulum, the first diverticulum here. <coughs> the second one that we see here, this lateral area, from this lateral area here, this is our Killian Jameson diverticulum. And this down over here that we see once again here in the central position, this is the Lamers diverticulum. So we have the Killian Jamison diverticula and we have the Lamers diverticula. Pulsion or false diverticulum through Killian Jamison area, Killian Jamison diverticula, and the Pulsion diverticulum through the Lamers or the Lamers dehiscens, Lamer diverticulum. Okay. So this is it. And then coming up to the next topic, one of the most important topics over here, that is our esophageal tumors. The esophageal tumors, as we can see that the benign tumors, these tumors in the esophagus can either be benign or malignant. They may be either benign or they may be either malignant. Benign tumors of the esophagus are relatively rare. And these benign tumors too that happen in the esophagus, the majority of them are not epithelial. The most common benign tumors of the esophagus are just the gastrointestinal stromal tumors. So benign tumors are rare. Most of them are non-epithelial in origin. And the most common gist of the esophagus is leomyoma. The malignant tumors of the esophagus includes two major variants. We may have either the squamous cell cancer. The squamous cell cancers mainly affects the upper two-thirds of the esophagus. Squamous cell carcinoma is by far the most common esophageal cancer all over the world and in India also. It is most common in the middle one third. So it affects both the upper and the middle one third, but these two areas, not the lower one third, sometimes rarely may happen here, but mainly happens in the upper two thirds. And in the upper two thirds, it is most common in the middle one third. So squamous cell cancer is most common in the middle one third. It is the most common esophageal malignancy. The second variant is the adenocarcinoma and adenocarcinoma mainly affects the lower one third. And for a question here, we can say that the most common esophageal malignancy of the lower one third is adenocarcinoma. Okay. Most common esophageal cancer, squamous. Most common esophageal cancer in the upper one third, squamous. Most common esophageal cancer in the middle one third, squamous. The most common esophageal cancer in the lower one third, adeno. Okay. Most common site of squamous cell cancer in the esophagus, middle one third. So this is it. The most common benign tumor that we had is the leomyoma. Now this leomyoma is the most common benign esophageal neoplasm. About 80% of these neoplasms, the leomyomas are intramural. They actually arise from the muscle layer, the smooth muscles, leomyoma. For the names, remember, a tumor from the skeletal muscle, we will use the word rhabdo. Rhabdomyoma, rhabdomyosarcoma. Rhabdomyoma, benign tumor of the skeletal, rhabdomyosarcoma, malignancy. The same thing here, leomyoma, smooth muscle, benign tumor. Leomyosarcoma, malignant tumor of the smooth muscle. So these tumors arise from the smooth muscles. They originate in the muscularis propria. These are usually slow growing and solitary tumors. And the commonest presentation is dysphagia. Whenever the patient presents to us with dysphagia, we perform all the investigations like the barium swallow, the endoscopy. Endoscopy is the investigation of choice for dysphagia. Okay. So here also for the investigation, we can go with barium swallow, the barium swallow, dysphagia. We perform the endoscopy. We see out that there is a tumor. We take in a biopsy and the biopsy will tell us which tumor is there. 
the investigation of choice for the tumors is endoscopic biopsy endoscopy with biopsy investigation of choice endoscopic ultrasound may be done here for the t staging we will see the endoscopic ultrasound dr rajendra will explain it to us but with the malignancy okay we will see it over there and then ct scan of the chest may be done just to see if any adjoining structure is involved or not if it has metastasized or not things like that t staging of the esophageal tumors is to be done with endoscopic ultrasound eus the management now this leomyoma the management will depend upon two things what is the size and if it involves the whole of the circumference that means annular the whole circumference is involved like this and becomes a structure like this and what exactly is the size of the tumor if the tumor is less than 8 cm and no annular characteristics meaning thereby that just just one portion is involved not the whole area not the whole circumference then extra mucosal enucleation is more than enough management of it if it is greater than 8 cm and with annular characteristics then we have to go with esophageal resection cut it out and anastomose it okay so this is it esophageal resection if more than 8 cm or annular in characteristic less than 8 cm and not annular characteristic extra mucosal enucleation less than 8 cm but annular resection should be done because now it becomes annular okay the treatment of the asymptomatic patients with small leomyomas that is less than 3 cm is controversial either we can go with surveillance only if the patient is not having any clinical features we can take the patient for surveillance with multiple biopsies or if the patient is having clinical presentations like dysphagia and all then we can go with a resection over here okay now the malignant tumors of the esophagus just as i told you there are two major variants the squamosal cancer and the adenocarcinoma they are the two common tumors of the esophagus the most common tumor of the esophagus is squamous cell cancer so the most common esophageal cancer squamous cell cancer most common in the middle one third though it may affect the upper two thirds rarely may be seen in the lower one third also like in aplasia cardia we had seen squamous cell cancer precipitates and is seen in the lower one third so in the lower one third adenocarcinoma and it is common in the high socio economic group and then our etiological or the risk factors for the esophageal cancers as we had seen the squamous cell cancers and the adenocarcinoma two major variants the etiology for them by far the most common etiology of the squamous cell cancer in the upper esophagus is tobacco and alcohol bronchogenic cancers also the same thing is there the squamous cell cancer actually is the most common tumor of trachea 2 trachea is the upper airway and the upper part of the esophagus we call it upper aero digestive tract upper esophagus and upper a part of the airway trachea the most common tumor of the upper aero digestive tract is squamous cell cancer okay so this is it tobacco and alcohol are by far the commonest ones then this may be seen in association with plumer vincent syndrome which is a topic for some other class we will see the plumer vincent syndrome aplasia we have already seen and once again for the question remember that squamous cell cancer lower one third nitrosamine exposure which is found in roasted food like tandoori chicken tandoori mutton or you people eat shashlik over there it has nitrosamine the exposure causes malignancy all over the gi tract not only esophagus esophagus stomach colon everywhere nitrosamine compounds tylosis palmaris tylosis plantaris deficiency of molybdenum zinc vitamin a 
and it is endemic in some area especially the asian cancer belt which starts from you can say the greater and the lesser caucasian area that is the area around uh, azerbaijan and from azerbaijan going up through the kazakhstan passing in through the mongolia and the upper part of china tibet and all that this is known as the asian cancer belt a number of malignancies the esophageal cancer pancreatic cancer they are endemic to that area maybe the reason being the food habits of alcohol and the roasted food roasted meat especially this may be a reason for it but it is not known that what actually is the cause of high incidence of cancers in this area asian cancer belt for the adenocarcinoma the most important risk factor is barrett's esophagus barrett's esophagus in itself it is a complication of gerd gastroesophageal reflux disease barrett's esophagus once again we'll take up in another class an integrated class with pathology then we'll go with this barrett's esophagus and the gerd okay if there is a metaplasia an increase in incidence of adenocarcinoma of the esophagus lower one third is seen and high fat diet <clears throat> the clinical presentation of the esophageal cancers esophageal malignancies dysphagia by far is the most common presentation the most common presenting symptom or the clinical feature is dysphagia regurgitation may be there vomiting odinophagia odinophagia means that there is pain in swallowing weight loss and when the malignancy advances and it goes and invades the adjoining structures this may go in and uh, invade the trachea giving rise to tracheoesophageal fistula then may involve the recurrent laryngeal nerve giving rise to recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy that is hoarseness of voice as a clinical feature horner's syndrome like the ptosis meiosis remember we had taken in the integrated class of anatomy and surgery we had taught you the thoracic outlet syndrome we had seen the horner syndrome over there then chronic spinal pain because the vertebrae has been invaded esophagus is just present over there diaphragmatic paralysis because of the involvement of the phrenic nerves may be seen so these are the features of advanced malignancy invading the adjoining structures by far the commonest presentation is dysphagia once the patient presents to us the investigation and the other associated features both of these either the squamous cell cancer or the adenocarcinoma may metastasize this tumor may spread either via a direct spread that means the wall of the esophagus in itself either move into the wall horizontally or move into the wall longitudinally both ways this is known as the direct spread it may be horizontally invading into the wall and going to the adjoining structures or longitudinally within the esophageal wall and traveling a long distance okay the longitudinal spread is through the submucosal lymphatics longitudinal spread then to the lymphatics it may go to other sites too normally this happens caudally meaning it goes down instead of going up but it may go up cranially also that means upwards and may even involve these supraclavicular nodes okay so lymphatic spread may also happen <coughs> any lymph node from the superior mediastinum to the celiac plexus or the lesser curvature of the stomach may be involved when it is going caudally down which is the common lymphatic spread may go upwards into the supraclavicular nodes and there may be a hematogenous spread also this may happen to the liver lungs and other organ system now mind you remember here if you remember the anatomy of the lower esophagus the lower most part of the esophagus drains into the portal vein this is why we have the esophageal varices in the lower esophagus with portal hypertension so the lower most part goes into the portal vein and ultimately reaches the liver 
and therefore the most common distant hematogenous metastasis of the esophageal cancer though it is present in the thorax is to the liver common site of distant hematogenous metastasis is to the liver here okay for the investigations the investigations we have already seen barium swallow barium swallow may give us a rat tail sign or we may have an apple core sign patient has dysphagia perform endoscopy endoscopy shows that there is a tumor perform endoscopic biopsy the investigation of choice for esophageal cancer is endoscopic biopsy then we have the endoscopic usg eus most important component of the t staging of the esophageal cancer then chest ct for the staging of the n and m metastasis nodes and other metastases and invasion of the adjoining structures bronchoscopy is actually the best investigation for the involvement of the mediastinal lymph nodes then pet ct for distant hematogenous spread like to the liver etc the next picture that we have this is the endoscopic picture malignant tumor of the esophagus this is showing us you can see this whole area the second one also here you can see then over to dr rajendra for the explanation of the endoscopic ultrasound dr rajendra could you please take over thank you very much sir okay uh, everybody can listen me just wait for a minute how to Mm. Sir, kindly make me the host. I'm making you the host. Right. Yes, sir. Mm. Okay, Dr. Ayer, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Cheers. <laughs> uh, Okay, now we are talking about the endoscopic ultrasound. This is the investigation of choice for the T staging. Now let's see what it is. Uh, we all know that there are the five layers. The first one is the mucosa. The second one is the deep mucosa and muscularis mucosa. Third one is submucosa. Muscularis propria is the fourth, and serosa is the last one. Now look at this image. Now in the front of mucosa, we are showing the white color. Okay. it means when we will see it on the ultrasound it will appear hyper echoic on in radiological language whenever i am using word hyper it means white now look at the deep mucosa and uh, muscularis mucosa this is appearing black okay look at this part the histology and us part okay now look at this sub mucosa it is denoted by the white color and the muscularis propria part is denoted by the black color now look at this image this one what is this this is our endoscopic ultrasound this is the probe and what is this this is esophagus the outer part is esophagus now look closely can you appreciate this white line the innermost what is this which is denoted by number 1 this is mucosa that's why we are denoting it with the white color okay this bright hyper echoic line is mucosa can you see there is a black line beyond that the hypo echoic line what is this this is the second layer which is muscularis mucosa and deep mucosa now look at this which is denoted by number 3 can you see one more white line okay one more hypo echoic layer what is this this is sub mucosa so basically there are alternative bands of white and black okay now look at this look for the number 4 one more black part which is denoting the muscularis propria layer okay and the last one is serosa why it is important why it is the investigation of choice now we can clearly see we can clearly denote the lines out here okay we can say ki okay this part is mucosa this is submucosa this is muscularis propria this is serosa 
So basically the TNM staging up to T1 stage up to involvement of submucosa, what we are going to call it, it is T1 stage. Okay. Involvement of this layer number four. Okay. Muscularis propria. Involvement of muscularis propria is called T2. Okay. T2 stage. And involvement beyond the muscularis propria, we can call it T3 stage. Okay. Now see, you can appreciate all the layers, all the layers out here. If there will be a lesion and it is involving only the mucosa, then we are going to call it T1 stage. Okay. So that's why it is helping an investigation of choice for the T staging. What if there is a lesion out here? Okay. If there is a lesion out here, which which is going beyond serosa, what we are going to call it? We are going to call it T3 and or T4 based on the other things. Now look at this first image. This is our probe. Okay. This is our endoscopic probe. Now look at these lesions. Can you appreciate these? Hypoechoic lesion. Rest of the part appears normal, but there are few hypoechoic lesions. Okay. So what are these? This could be the carcinoma. And on the basis of this, we can see this bright line and this hypoechoic line. So on basis of this, we can say it is also involved in the muscularis propria. Okay, students. So this is how we are going to go for the T staging in the uh, esophageal carcinoma. And this is why it's the investigation of choice. So now the rest part will be covered by Dr. Nachiketa. Kindly, sir, continue. Sure, please make me the host. And thank you so much, Dr. Rajendra, for such a nice explanation of the endoscopic, endoscopic ultrasound. Yes, I am making the host. Just wait for a minute, soon. Yes, sir, now you are the host. So very thankful to you, Dr. Ajay, for such a nice explanation of the endoscope. It's really great. Thank you. So now, students, let's come back to the esophageal cancer and the management of the esophageal cancer. As such, we are not going to the staging of it because the stages are not so commonly as, as far as the T staging is concerned, Dr. Rajendra has already explained it to you guys. So there shouldn't be any problem. The management of choice for the esophageal cancer is a radical esophagectomy. It is the most important aspect of the curative treatment. Surgery is best suited to the patient in whom the disease is confined to the esophagus. That is T1, R2, and N0. T1, T2, N0. This is the best patient suitable for surgery. The number of different types of surgeries that may be utilized here. We can either go with the, the Ivor Lewis esophagectomy, that is two phase esophagectomy. This is Ivor Lewis, two phase esophagectomy. This surgery sometimes is written down as Lewis Tanner operation also. The other surgery which is available to us is known as the three-phase esophagectomy, that is the Macuans. Then we have a trans-hiatal esophagectomy, meaning thereby that if the tumor is just above the esophageal hiatus, we can go through the abdominal area, laparotomy, move up into the thorax through the hiatus and remove the tumor. This is trans-hiatal esophagectomy. This is known as the Oringer's esophagectomy. Surgery is followed by reconstruction because this area has been removed. We need to make it continuous. What we may do is pull up the stomach and anastomose it with the esophagus. Or we may bring out some other area, some an another anatomical structure like the colon and interpose in between these two areas. So the surgery is followed by reconstruction and the best conduit for reconstruction of the esophagus is stomach itself, which is followed very closely by the colon. Suppose if we have removed the stomach also, it is not available to us. There was a longitudinal spread. In that scenario, gastrectomy too was done. Esophagectomy plus gastrectomy. 
then to interpose in between these two area, the best option is colon. Okay. So along with these, chemotherapy may be done in some selected patient. Okay. Squamous cell cancer is actually responds very nicely to chemotherapeutic regimes. So only in some selected patient of squamous cell cancer, we may use chemotherapy or chemoradiotherapy. The commonest drugs that we utilize here are cisplatin, 5-fluorouracil, vinblastin, and bleomycin. These are the commonest drugs used for chemotherapy of the esophageal squamous cell cancer. If the cancer is beyond these, then we have to palliate the patient. For the palliation, we can go in with stenting, intubate the patient, and along with that, also insert over here with the help of an endoscope, a stent in the esophagus so that the food bypasses the area and passes down into the stomach. Pal intubation and stenting is the palliation. For very early tumors, that is carcinoma in C2, we can insert an endoscope and through the endoscope using a laser probe, we can burn the tumor for carcinoma in C2. For the very early esophageal tumors, this is known as laser fulguration. Laser fulguration is done using ND YAG laser. ND YAG that is uh, neodymium yttrium aluminium garnate. ND YAG. Photodynamic therapy may also be done. Okay. The surgeries that we had seen, the two phase, the Ivor Lewis of the three phase surgeries, these surgeries, how they are done, you can see that in this first one, a laparotomy was done here, along with thoracotomy, this area, this area is laparotomy, the lower area, and this upper area is the, what you call thoracotomy, okay? In this, you can see this once again, a laparotomy is done here and a thoracotomy is done over here. If we have a tumor in the uppermost part here, then we'll also need a thoracotomy in the uppermost part here. So one down here, laparotomy, thoracotomy, mobilize the esophagus and then resect it. This is going to be three phase. Okay. So this is it the different surgeries that we have and the complications of these surgeries. The complication of these surgeries, the most common early complications are respiratory, early complication. But overall, the most common late problem of the surgery is anastomotic leak, benign anastomotic stricture and leak. Okay. Late problem stricture, early problem that we have is leak here. Fine. And respiratory problems, respiratory. So this is it, early respiratory leak from the anastomosis. And for the late what we have is stricture. These are the complications. So this is it and how to proceed in these patients, the whole flow chart of it. First, what we see out is that if the patient is fit for surgery or not, if the patient is fit for surgery, then we'll further go in and if it is not, then palliation, like stenting, all those things, or maybe even chemo radiation. If there is hematogenous metastasis or not, if metastasis is present, go with palliation, no need of surgery, not of much use, no hematogenous metastasis to the liver or any other structure. If there is any invasion of the adjacent organs, if there is an invasion, once again, palliation, there is no invasion, and then there is no peritoneal spread. If peritoneal spread is there, go with palliation. Then lymph node metastasis is checked out. No lymph node metastasis, surgery alone. Lymph node metastasis, multimodal, meaning thereby surgery plus chemotherapy, surgery plus radiotherapy, or surgery plus chemoradiation. All the three modalities. 
this is the flow chart of the management. So this is it, guys, for the surgery part of it. And with this, we are going to end up our session for today. Thank you so much for being with us. So this is it, Dr. Rajan. I'm yes, sir, thank you, you very much, sir. Back to you. Yes, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nachiketa. Special thanks to Maxwell Platform and Dr. Sunil Sharma. Thanks for providing those such beautiful platform of Naxilo to our students. Thank you very much. And special thanks to Dr. Nachiketa for such a beautiful oh, please, presentation. Please. Sir. <laughs> I'm actually very thankful to you because the radiology part is one of the most important and the common questions asked in this. Yes, sir. but <laughs> and um, actually what the commonest questions are the corkscrew appearance, the yes, bird sir. beak, the rat tail, yes, and sir. then they'll show you the endoscopic ultrasound. This yes, is where but... the uh, student gets uh, perplexed. Surgery, yes. it's simple. Hellas myotomy, long esophago myotomy. <laughs> then we have the two phase esophagectomy, three phase esophagectomy. We have the transhiatal esophagectomy. But sir, you have explained so much beautifully that we, uh, the students will be able to understand what was I was trying to show them. When they will rewind this again, uh, this same recording again and again, they will get it way more better. Thank you very much, sir. So anyway, thank you so much. Once okay, again, thanks. Bye.